Thank you very much, Chris. You really did cut that speech up, but I think the point is you, well, as always, you covered the key points. Um, you mentioned the fact that there have been, uh, you know, we've had decades of no growth in Jamaica, and I always, uh, in all the discussions we've been having in the last week, I keep reminding people, if uh, if we think we've done badly here in Jamaica, the Irish were doing even better. They had, they had generations without growth before they finally got their act together in the way they have so remarkably. I was saying yesterday when, uh, I was uh, speaking with Chris and um, Sandra Glasgow that I'm actually, after this week of consultations and the research we've been doing on both social partnerships abroad and also the experiences here in Jamaica, I'm actually cautiously optimistic. I'm optimistic because um, one of the things that is very clear from all the consultations, there is broad consensus on, if you will, the strategic vision as to where the country will go. The caution comes in because the devil will be in the details. And I think that what has undermine past agreements hasn't been anything necessarily in the way of bad faith on the part of the partners. It's been in the, the details of implementation which can in turn, however, create that sort of distrust because an unanticipated outcomes emerge which cause some of the partners to say, well, you know, this, this isn't what I had in mind. Um, and that undermines it. There's a lot, actually, though, in the way of, of sort of these details that, uh, that can be pinned down on which the players we're speaking with uh, agree. So it seems that uh, while the devil will be in the details, and, and, and several speakers this morning have underscored a point that came out of the presentations of the last week by Paul Haran, which is the, the need to have some kind of proper, call it a secretariat uh, in Ireland, they call it the National Economic Social Council, which will be properly resourced, will have clear TOR, and um, will, will very importantly, will not duplicate the work that's already been done, but will integrate the many initiatives already underway. If anybody wants to add anything to the mix this morning or merely ask any questions of the, uh, the rather um, very interesting speeches we've heard, um, maybe some of you want to ask Chris what he would have said had he had you know, more than two minutes, but, um, uh, but you, or you may probably want to ask Paul Haran. So, so I'll turn, throw the floor open for the last few minutes before we break up. Um, ju just to, uh, um, maybe didn't get it, maybe Paul had mentioned it, but just want to know the trade union response, uh, how they reacted, how they cooperated with the whole arrangement. Yeah, there's two pieces. First of all, the trade unions would have been members of our National Economic Social Council going through many, many years. And they would have had contributed to, they would have asked for certain research to be done, and they would have shared in the analysis. Secondly, when we went forward and to have our agreements, within the agreement, the trade unions will be just one social partner. I don't mean that in a diminutive way, but they will be one social partner. And in the middle of the agreements, there's a bargain. So the social partners would have worked hard to strike that bargain. Probably two or three pieces to it, one for the public sector, one for maybe construction, and maybe another one. Congress of trade unions and some of the, some of the bigger unions would be at all of the meetings. But at the very end of the bargain, the trade union movement then has to go off to Congress, led by the Congress, and try to agree with individual unions whether or not we go forward. And we never had an agreement where everybody said yes. We never ever had an agreement that everybody said yes. There was always quite a big debate in the Congress of trade unions where there were the yeses and the noes. But on balance, the unions always said, yes, we will do this. Um, individually, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the unions believing and the leadership of the unions taking a position that this was in the better interest of their members. Not, in, not of their better interest, interest for the trade unions themselves, but they looked down to the membership and they said that this will give our members a better outcome for their, in their livelihoods. Then they would have asked government for certain things such as protections, we have a minimum wage now in Ireland. Um, often the trade unions would fight that in any wage bargain that it would be differentiated by earnings level. So there would be a higher amount, higher percentage given to poorer workers than more wealthy workers. So they would have modulated the nature of the bargain and fought to do that and asked government for certain investments maybe in training and in protections and legislation around the labour courts 
and the conciliation and arbitration system. So I think if, if the only people that they were bargaining with were the employers, it wouldn't have worked. I think we needed government to be giving things in as well to the mix. But there was great leadership. Uh, can I? Oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to f a follow up, if you like. The labor relation, is it? Just remind me, Paul, it's the labor relations. Um, we have a labor relations commission. We have yeah, rights LRC, commissioners. LRC, yeah, the, the one that... We have the, rights commissioners and we have a labor court. Yeah, the, the, the one that, the, the, where you sit around and have a cup of, uh, of water until you actually get an agreement. Uh, you want, you want, to, want to go to that like, bit? Like we have, we have conciliators and arbitrators. In a conciliation service, and like I've been a conciliator at disputes, and we, we, like it's, a, it's an old fashioned type of structure, technology, but you get solutions at five o'clock in the morning when people really want a cigarette, the coffee's gone, and the people, you, know, you, you do the bilateral shuffling, and then you have everybody in a room and they strike bargains. We have much less of that today than we had in the past, but in the past we had it fairly bad. And one of the tricks for me as a conciliator in a way was to have a very good easy chair in my room and an alarm. And I could leave the room looking haggard, let the social partner, let the employer and the trade union reps fight, go in and have a snooze, set the alarm and come in looking haggard again. <laughs> but they took leadership. Like the, the thing is about leadership and it's about understanding that we're trying to secure outcomes for our people, not just go through a process. Mark Golding. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hearn, I wanted to ask you about the politics of that process that you went through in Ireland, especially in the formative period when it was just getting off the ground. Um, how did it play out between the government and the opposition? Um, was it that, how was the opposition um, minded to get on board and support the process as opposed to um, passively or actively undermining it? because they, they were fearful that if it got results, it would mean wilderness for them for a protracted period. I'm interested to hear how that played out in Ireland. Yeah, and you mightn't like the answer I give you. We have a multi-seat PR system in Ireland, which makes it easy. That's multi-seat, a constituency to be multi-seat, and PR is the mechanism of election. And in our society, as I said, the people knew how bad it was. And this sheer sense of, desper of, of desperation meant as a new political party emerged, a party who was committed to transforming the economy. And that party developed great traction. So in 1987, we had an election. And the dominant party managed to win, but in a minority government context. And they realized that the society had totally changed. And they had lost a lot of seats because they hadn't embraced the need to fix it and to take actions rather than do rhetoric. And I think it's very important, actions rather than talk are what transforms and builds trust and all those things. And what happened was, and the government led the process, opposition was passive player only. They were never active. And the opposition leader, after it had been done, and it was this, we were talking about sort of recovering from a crisis, so we have to picture the crisis and a sense of crisis. And the opposition leader at the time did a thing which is called the Talis strategy and said, I will not oppose government cutbacks as long as they're <laughs> comprehended by the agreement. And the opposition spoke, the opposition, the dominant party didn't oppose. And the leader of that party lost his position at the next election. <laughs> And the dominant party, um, they didn't increase, but they came back in again in a minority government, in a coalition government. So I don't offer um, the vision of an opposition party, passively or actively, well, in our case, it was a passive support, because they weren't involved. We don't, the opposition party doesn't become involved in the, social, in the partnership agreement, because they have nothing to give. They have nothing to say, I'll give you. So they don't become involved in agreement. And sometimes they resent the bypassing of parliament in the determination of many policies. So they didn't necessarily gain. Their analysis would be that if they did anything to undermine what happened, they would have been written off completely. 
they would have ceased to exist. Because we were at a position where the whole society knew what needed to be done. And nobody would have forgiven somebody for preventing it. But not preventing it maybe prevented their extinction. But they would still be licking their wounds today about how it was managed. And I said, that's not necessarily the answer people, you know, if I'm coming here to sell a product, no. it's not the answer I would give to sell a product. It mightn't be. Yeah. Yeah.